Welcome to the LA Soccer Hub Show. My name is Gio Garcia. Today is Wednesday, November 25th, a day after LAFC lost against uh, Seattle Sounders 3-1. Uh, another heartbreaking game for LAFC. Um, where there, where this MLS playoffs have been, been there have been so many upsets. Um, you know, last night, you know, you had Toronto get knocked out. You also had Nashville pull up the upset. You know, they won 1-0. And, you know, if you're an LAFC fan, you're hoping they'd pull off the trifecta with, uh, you know, with knocking out Seattle in Seattle. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, but we do have Delmi here to help us break down the game and, you know, talk about the game and what we saw, what we like and what we didn't like. So Delmi, how you doing? Hi, good. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's always a pleasure to have you on. You know, you're really knowledgeable about, about LAFC and what, and what goes on here. Obviously, you know, you know this team just as good as I do. So let, let me ask you, how have you enjoyed the MLS playoffs and, you know, and everything that's happened, <laughs> the craziness and the entertainment, and then we'll get into the game. You know what? I'm actually enjoying playoffs a lot this year. I think there's something about the one and done format that I feel brings like a whole nother level to the games and they've all been exciting and I have not been bored at any of these games. Um, they've just been exciting. It's been fun to watch. Um, I mean, I have no complaints and a lot of fans are not too thrilled, you know, with this one and done format. Obviously, if it's not your team winning, it sucks, but I feel like it does bring a lot of excitement. I feel like people are noticing the league right now. They're talking about the league. So I've really enjoyed them and I really enjoyed, I mean, obviously, besides the results of the LAFC game, I really enjoyed the upsets yesterday. It was fun. Yeah, yeah. And I, the other game I forgot to mention was uh, uh, New England beating number one seed Philadelphia 2-0. Two, two um, so no, the number one seed and the number two seed in the Eastern Conference are knocked out by the Dying. eighth and set by the eighth and seventh seed. And like you said, those one off games, you know, it, it seems like anybody uh, can has an opportunity. Right. Um, but it, it has been exciting. It has been thrilling. A lot of a couple of the games have let, gone to extra time penalties you know it's like you know I think I was it uh Portland and Dallas I watched yes. that PK one oh that, my was, gosh. that one was intense <laughs> that one was really good and you know I think I, I don't know if it was Taylor Twelveman um I think it was him but uh they were talking about how Portland didn't didn't practice PKs they didn't they didn't practice PKs and lo and behold the game it goes to PKs goes to PKs <laughs> Um, you know, and they ended up losing the game in PKs, which is unfortunate. But, you know, those, there's so many things in a knockout game like this that you have to take into account and you have to practice for because you never know if the game ends 1-1, 0-0, or you have to go to PKs. So there's a lot of things that, that are happening and it's just making uh, the entertainment value of the MLS just even better. Yes, they've been so unpredictable. I like to kind of compare it to March Madness a little bit, you yep. know, the one and done games like I feel like the whole scene has kind of gone out the window just because you're you ranked higher it does not mean you are necessarily going to win the game and it brings like I said a whole other level of excitement people are noticing um, people are talking about the league about the team so that's always a good thing. Yeah and you mentioned like uh, the March Madness and I think right now the Cinderella story is Nashville FC I think and yes. that's everybody's uh, <laughs> Cinderella story so it's a it's exciting so and you and you start to see that you know there are certain uh, teams where they can have fans. And I think Nashville was one of them. I think obviously we know Dallas. So it's exciting. I just wished everybody, all the fans could have been there when the penalties were going. Because maybe if you're in uh, Portland, that would have favored Portland a little bit more. But in the year that we're living in, you know, things happen. And I think when it goes to PKs or whether you're home or away and there's no fans, there's no real advantage, right? Because, you know, you don't have the pressure of the fans either for or against you. Um, unless you live in a state where you're allowed to have some some type of fans in there. Right. No, it definitely brings an entire different element when you add that fan base, that crowd, those cheers or those boos, you know, if you're the opposing team. Of course, it's very different. And in a way, though, I think that's what makes it so even feel, right? That's what makes it so unpredictable where you just don't know what's going to happen because there is no real advantage besides a little bit of luck. Hopefully you train the things that you need to be trained for and just wish for the best. But um, but like you said, Nashville being that Cinderella story and I'm all for Nashville right now. And of course, um, previous LAFC player and Walker Zimmerman, also defensive player of the year, which is pretty cool to see him do so well in that team after being, you know, let go by LAFC. But 
I'm rooting for them. I hope that they go far. I know not a lot of people think that they will, or maybe after yesterday they do, but um, we'll see how that turns out for them. Yeah, Walker Zimmerman it just goes to show the type of quality uh, defender and player he really is because he's showing up for this team, uh, a team that is essentially built off the back line, build build off the defense, and you know that's what's helping them. That's what helped them win yesterday against Toronto, and you know it was just a surprise trade to start off the year 2020 uh, for LFC and for let for to let him go, um, yeah. you know, for money when. I really thought, you know, this was uh, a key player for LAFC and, you know, would probably have a long career with LAFC, but, you know, things went, went the other way. Um, but we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah. I want to, I want, I want to get into the, the game now. Um, you know, Oof. we, we knew, yeah, we knew <laughs> going, going into this game, it was going to, it was going to be tough, right? But no Diego Rossi, uh, no Brian Rodriguez, no Jose Cienfuentes, essentially three out of four starters. Uh, we knew Diego Palacios. I don't know if he would have started, maybe, maybe not. Um, but you were missing three of the four starters for sure. Um, and then and t- to add on top of that, uh, news also broke uh, yesterday before the game uh, that Danny Masewski was not available for LAFC. Uh, you know, I think that also hurt them a lot because, you know, you can you can have you can sub a striker for a striker, whether it be a started, you know, you can sub in uh, Danny Masewski. And, and they were missing a, a team that has scored so many goals within the last couple of years missed so much of that that I was like okay how is this lineup going to be then you know you can already start to assume that it it was going to be you know uh Christian Torres because Bob Bradley had talked about Christian Torres BWP and Carlos Bella up top I think to me what I was more interested was the back line and how he went but uh he also started uh, I should say Pablo Cisnegas which which is very uh because we haven't seen him he had like a hip right. injury um so he started Pablo Cisnegas over Kenneth Vermeer. Kenneth Vermeer had finished out the season. He looked good. Um, so, I mean, that's what he went with. I, I didn't have a, a problem with that. I think Pablo Cisnegas did the best he could uh, against a very, very tough, um, very tough Seattle Sounders. And the goals they scored was just quality goals. And, you know, if, whether it was Vermeer or not, uh, in that, in there, I don't, I don't think Vermeer would have stopped those. But I think on the back line, when he went with Jordan Harvey on the left, Tristan Blackman in the middle, Seuss Mourinho, obviously, and then Eddie Segura on the right on the right hand side. Uh, I was a little surprised, uh, and maybe El Monier didn't get, didn't start mm-hmm. uh, right back. Um, but I see that he wanted to go with this bigger bigger players, bigger physical players. I feel like Eddie Segura played really well there uh, on the right back, and Tristan Blackman played a really solid game at, at center back. Jordan Harvey, he he had uh, his moments at times, but I feel like. You know, towards the end, right before he got subbed out, he didn't really have, he didn't impact the game that much. And I feel like, you know, you you wanted some of your your, your back line to help you offensively, especially the guys out out on the outside. Uh, what do what did you make of the, of the back line in uh, Pablo starting? Um, it didn't surprise me uh, that Cisnega started. I actually I would have gone for Cisnega over Vermeer. I know you know the battle between both <laughs> both goalies is always constant, but. For me, at this point, I have more confidence in Cisniega. I feel like he's shown up in bigger moments. Also, like you said, I don't know. The Seattle team, it's a hard team to beat, right? It's a hard team to beat. I don't know if Vermeer would have necessarily done any better. Case of the matter, Cisniega got the nod. I, I'm happy with that. That back line, with all due respect to Jordan Harvey, but I feel like Jordan Harvey hasn't necessarily brought in much to the team this entire season. Um, so I was surprised to see him back there. But, and, and I agree with you. And when you're, if it would have been me, I would have put him in the starting lineup. I was shocked that he wasn't in that starting when he did get subbed in, of course, right? You're happy that he's in, but that's probably something that should have happened a lot sooner or like we're saying, like he should have gotten that start. But that back line in general is obviously something that the team has problems with. And it's in my opinion, the number one thing that they need to address moving into this offseason and things that need to need to change, need to bring in new players, they need to bring someone who's actually going to be able to fulfill those needs in the back line. Um, it wasn't necessarily the formation I would have gone with, um, not necessarily the starting um, lineup that I would have gone with, but alas, you know, it worked out how it did and you can only hope that moving forward, they're going to bring those missing pieces that is going to give them a stronger back line because they desperately do need that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's no secret that LAFC's back line has been uh, bad, just bad. Yeah. I mean, they, they consider, I think, 39 goals. 
uh, this year compared to last year with 36, and they played more games last year than they did this year. Um, a lot of the inconsistencies, yeah, you can blame mm-hmm. COVID and all that, but the back line just hasn't looked good, especially if you're going to play a 4-3-3, four, four, three, three, um, which you're going to have to – you're going to need the speed on the outside. You're going to need uh, sometimes your center back to cover for, for your outside right back or your left back. And, you know, unfortunately – LAFC has not done that and you know I know we talked about Walker Zimmerman um he's looking great where he's at but I yeah. think even if you had Walker Zimmerman you still need uh, a right back and a solid left back and you know and, and those are things that are they're gonna have to be addressed by LAFC within the next couple of days because I know there's the, the MLS requires certain things coming up here within the next couple of days um so I mean it's no secret um I do want to talk about the midfield. He had Mark Anthony K on the left side, a twist in the middle, Latif Blank blessing. Obviously, I think that's the strongest. Yeah, that's the strongest core that the LAC uh, had there. But I think even throughout the game, I didn't really see that much of blessing and Mark Anthony K, and I know the reason why. Um, Nicholas Lodero, that guy's that guy's incredible. That guy is everywhere. He he destroyed LAFC's midfield. Yeah, which is it, it, LAFC has a so has depth at the midfield. That's what we like. Okay, they you know they they they'll probably be even up there. They'll probably be even up top. But you know, to when LAFC started the game, they didn't they didn't hype. They didn't press up high like they normally do. They waited. They sat back. Um, you know, they didn't, it wasn't a, as high as you typically did. And I, for what I thought was like, okay, you know, you're going to need Bradley Wright Phillips to play 90 minutes. You're going to need potentially Christian Torres to play 50, 60 minutes. Uh, obviously, you're going to need Vela to play every single minute plus additional time. So I was like, okay, this makes sense. You're going to wait, um, especially because on the 4-3-3, four, 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 three, three, you're going to be vulnerable. Um, you know, and not, now to talk about the, the, the three up top, you know, you had Torres on the hmm. left you know, BWP, uh, Carlos Vela, Christian Torres became the youngest uh, MLS player to start a playoff game at 16 years old. Amazing accomplishment for him and the team. Unfortunately, the way the game went and everything like that, we really didn't see that much of Christian Torres. And I, I just don't, I just don't think people at LASC realize how great of a team Seattle really is. And I know you mentioned this earlier, um, I just don't think with the weapons LAFC went into this match. And I know Bob wants to play a 4-3-3. Um, I just don't think this 4-3-3 uh, lineup or, you know, formation was going to be any impactful because of the players he, he was going to have to come in. You know, maybe if you had Latif Blessing on the left-hand side up top or, you know, you started Adrian Perez or whatever, but you really didn't see nothing up them connect up top the midfield got beat up a lot you know and it, it, for the majority of the game Seattle really controlled and dictated this game oh absolutely and I think I think what you're saying about I, I do feel almost that teams in a way underestimate Seattle you know they think that it's going to be not that they're going to think it's going to be an easy team to beat but I think that they're not considering how good of a team they are um, going to the beginning of the game. Like you say, they weren't pressing high. And we talked about this. Seattle can just dismantle that game plan because you just know that that's, that's their style of play. That's what they're going to come on with. Um, and I think that in itself was already a disadvantage um, going into that, into that game. As far as every, everything else, it just wasn't a good overall game for anybody. I didn't see, I didn't see, I mean, the start of the game was pretty bad. I did feel like it got better as it as it progressed. Um, but I also feel like mentally, they're able to get in their heads pretty quickly, in my opinion. And I feel like as much as people want to say that it doesn't affect them, I do feel like to some capacity, it does change things for them. But also I find it interesting because in the pressures, even before the game, I know you were on those calls, everyone that talked across the board had nothing but positive things to say about training, right? They had been a really great couple of weeks. They all felt very good. They were going into the Seattle game very confident. Um, bring up Cristian Torres, you know, being at, at top. Everyone had nothing but praise for him and showing confidence in what he was going to be able to bring to this matchup against Seattle. So I do have to wonder what exactly those couple of weeks did look like in training. Is this a formation that they did train with? You know, was it was it something that maybe changed last minute um, when you bring in factors like um, Masovsky not playing or that kind of thing? 
it just makes me really question what those internal conversations have been with the players and going into this game, what their game plan was versus what it ended up being for reasonings like Seattle knows their weaknesses. They're going to be able to expose them um, on things like pressing high and whatnot. Um, so I, I, I would kill to kind of just know what those conversations were like, because I feel like what we saw in the field did not really align to the things that everyone was saying leading up to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't just, just to hit on your point. I don't think uh, Bob Riley would is or would ever change the four three three, even though he's been asked about it. Um, you know, I'm just going to go on a limb. I just don't think the four three three, uh, and I know he's not going to change it, whatever. I may get criticized for this, but it, you're not going to beat Seattle with the four three three with yeah. the weapons you have in this, in the way you went to in this game. And I know it's kind of, it's hard for you to change your formation in a playoff game and play a different style. Um, you know, if a four two two, I mean, or, or a four four two, you know, I think would have been could have been an option, maybe not. You know, I may I may just be you know throwing something out there. But when you sub, um, when you know after the game, um, well, I, I just want to get into 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 the the, four, the the high press first, and then I'll get into the subs. They didn't they didn't high press until Seattle scored that goal until yeah. the eighteenth minute. Once that happened, then things started to change. Mm-hmm. And then Seattle can tell because Brian Smitzer, apologize if I said his last name wrong, Smitzer or whatever. That's how he, I say it. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's. I mean, that guy is a hell of a coach. Um, he's out coached Bob Bradley. He, this this year and last year and last year's playoffs, he, he's just he's just out, out coached Bob Bradley. He knows what Bob Bradley's going to do. He knows, I mean, both both coaches are stubborn in their ways. Um, but Brian Smitzer just had, has had the best of them. Uh, in 2020 and in last year's playoff. Um, this is the third game in Seattle and the third loss in yeah. Seattle for, for LAFC. Um, you know, and I understand, and I know people are going to, we can also wonder what would it look like with, you know, he had a uh, reigning golden boot winner, Diego Rossi, right? I, I completely agree with Jose Sinfuentes, with uh, Brian Rodriguez, you know, Diego, Diego Palacios. I know that that's the conversation, but last year, Brian Smitzer, came to the Bank of California and beat you 3-1 at home um, because they roughed up Carlos Vela. They knew exactly what you were going to do, you know, and I think we have to look at what Brian Smitzer has done against Carlos, I mm-hmm. mean, Bob Bradley's teams, you know, and and he knows when they high press, when and you start to see him more in the second half, when, when, when LAFC started to high press more in the second half, all Seattle did you know, credit to Nicholas Dodero, the job he was doing in the midfield, but the all Seattle instantly switched the ball over to the, the other side because they knew they would have like when the ball's on let's like say the ball's on the left or right side, the defender, LAFC's defender has to tuck in the middle. So when you switch the ball over, the players aren't going to be able to to um, adjust quick enough, you know, to, to their lines or whatever. And I saw that happen th- the more LAFC press because they were so high up there, they would yeah. switch it. And, you know, that's that just credit to Brian Schmitcher. He knows how he's going to play. He knows he, he has Nicholas Lodero. And, you know, you had Seattle's big players, uh, big three players step up in this game. And unfortunately for LAFC, Carlos Vela, you know, he got he got a penalty kick. I think it was in the 20th minute. Let me see. Yeah, it was in the 20, 20th minute. Knew who tripped up Carlos Vela <laughs> inside the box. And I was like, okay, this was like two minutes right after they Seattle scored. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. You know, okay, you know, you even up the score. You know, you still kind of, you know, the momentum still pretty even. But then Vela PK was terrible. It was, yeah. it, was a, it, was, it was it was the worst. And I think you can't you can't let things you when a game like this every opportunity you have to make you have to make it count Vela knows this Bob knows this but you, for you to take a penalty like that like nonchalant and just you know not even you know you thought the keeper was gonna dive I was expecting him for him just to rip it either one side or the other mm-hmm. and I know he's gonna want to have that back but you know he is a big player he is the best player in this league and for him to have a performance to him to have a PK like that it's just something you don't want to see I completely agree with pretty much everything you said. Going back to Brian, giving him credit, you bring up a good point about they they did come into the bank and they were still they were still able to get that win. And I think the thing with Brian is he he has Bob Bradley figured out. They mm-hmm. have this LAFC team figured out. And that's what the biggest advantage is for LAFC playing up against Seattle, that they know them so well that even when they try to make those changes, they can't, they can't 
make changes, make enough changes to the point where they're going to throw Seattle out of their game. It's just not going to happen. As far as the PK, I agree. I thought he was going to take it one side or the other. He he took it literally right through the center and just went straight into Fry's hands. It couldn't have been a worse PK if even if he had tried. Um, and I did look up a stat because I was very curious to know. And I think I saw something online that this was maybe Fry's 18th PK save in a row, um, which is crazy to me. But I mean, and, and that's another thing that that has been a problem with this team as well, just being able to capitalize on those opportunities, whether they, it is a PK, whether it is a set piece, um, whether whatever the whatever the example is, they have a hard time being able to capitalize off of the opportunities, which is what has put them in this predicament of not being able to finish, not being able to win games, not being able to to remain consistent, and to see Carlos Vela make that PK and that happen the way it did. Yeah, it's unfortunate. And even Bob Bradley did mention post game. He was he was angry at himself, right? And as he should be. Um, but I think it had he made that PK, it definitely would have changed the game a little bit and that momentum at least in hopes that LAFC could somehow pull this off. Yeah, I think yeah, the momentum would have been different, you know, even even one one. Um, you know, though Seattle still felt like even after they scored one, they 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 still kind of control control the game. You know? Oh yeah, you had, you had Christian Roldan. You know, he hit the crossbar. You know, they were just so active. You know, but it's uh, at halftime it stayed one zero, but Seattle still controlled the game, right? So Seattle still controlled the game, and I think coming into the second half, I was like, okay, this game, second half is like where they're gonna make the adjustments, and the adjustment that LAFC made right out the gate was take. Bradley Wright Phillips, your yeah. MLS comeback player of the year, uh, what a goal, a, a goal scoring threat. Um, you take him out from Mahala. We haven't seen Mahala at all this year, really. Um, I don't know what he showed Bob Bradley these last two weeks. Um, you know, with him playing, but like it's different when you're actually playing competition. So Bradley Wright Phillips was subbed in for Mahala. Um, I thought that was i was like okay one either bwp <laughs> we saw he's injured something happened um but after the press conference bob said that he wanted to get i'm just paraphrasing here he wanted to get vela more in the middle to just you know get him the ball more he didn't want to play him out wide um and if that's the reason you 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 sub Bradley Wright phillips out of the game just to get vela to play that false number nine and you have Mahala outright, and you still have Christian Torres. You have a 19-year-old on the right who's unproven yet. You have Christian Torres that's still proven himself. He's 16 years old, but he, yeah. he can only do so much, and he didn't do that much in the first half. Credit goes to him. I wasn't playing at the level he is playing, but you're also playing against, I think, the best team in the MLS. You only have Vela, a, a real actual threat, in my opinion, up top. You know, I think to me, that sub, I wanted to know more. Unfortunately, I didn't get to ask him, but we're going to go with what he said, that he wanted to get Vela in there. I think him taking out a goal-scoring threat made it easier for Seattle down the line because, you know, they know who BWP is. They know who, who, who what he can do. But Hala, yeah, I know he has speed and everything, but to me, it wasn't it wasn't the same quality of player or the same type of threat, I should say, but I know why, why he did that. And I, I don't think that sub at, at 45 minutes made sense to me. No, I agree. That surprised me to see um, BWP out. It surprised me. I was expecting him to go an entire 90, especially against a team like Seattle. I feel like this wasn't the game or the place to, in my opinion, take for me, it was more or less a bit of a gamble. Um, it was a, a bit of a gamble and Christian Torres, again, like you're saying to his credit, he's improved a lot and done great things for the club. And he has a bright future here, but this isn't just any game. This is the playoff game that they need to win in order to advance and putting that kind of pressure. And, and I understand that they have confidence and all the faith in the world 
on him, but I don't necessarily think that this was the game to put it all on the line for him. Um, I would have loved to see Bradley Wright Phillips stay in the game. Um, like you said, Bob did mention that he just wanted to possibly just create more space for Vela and be able to have more opportunities run through him. Um, I think I told you earlier, I, I did try to reach out to, the L, to LAOC to see if there was anything more as far as maybe there is an injury. I know he had a little, little bit of a knock there with Cisniega. Maybe that has something to do, maybe concussion protocol, maybe something else that could um, yeah, but they explain. didn't tell us though. They didn't, yeah. they didn't tell us. So we have to go with, you know, exactly. what, what, so we, you can... what they, what, what, it's not an injury unless yeah. they tell us otherwise it's not an injury. Which they haven't told us otherwise. So if we're going strictly off of that, in my opinion, it was a mistake to take him out, period. BWP should have stayed in the game and that he's a scoring machine. He's been able to produce for that team every, every game. He's been able to do something. You can feel his presence on, not to take away obviously from Vela. Of course, we know what he can do. Um, but with having BWP, you're only making your, your team stronger. And like you said, we haven't seen a lot of Mahala, not that he can't produce and do good things. I just don't think that this is the game to play with fire, you know, and test the waters and, and give perhaps someone like him more minutes. I do think that that was a mistake. Um, and, and BWP should have finished that game. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a playoff game. You want to have yeah. your, your your biggest threats. And, you know, uh, to me, I don't know what he saw from Mahala the last. Like, we're not at practice. We're not yeah. there. But even I, I'm pretty sure Seattle was surprised about, about that sub. You know, it's just unless, like I said, unless it's an injury, which we haven't been told it's, it hasn't. It was more tactically. And to me, I, I agree. It, it's, it's, it was a mistake. Um, and, you know, 10 minutes later, Adrian Perez subs in for, subs in for Christian Torres. You know, and it's I, I just think... I think Christian Torres should have came out first. You know, Christian Torres, none of, to be fair, nobody up top outside of Vela. You know, BWP did not have a good game. Let's be let's be honest. He did he did not have a good game, um, because there was the offense up there, for them to create offense. It was very hard because Seattle made it very hard. But even with BWP having not only seven touches, I believe, yeah, uh, he had seven. in the first half was the lowest in his career. Um, you still give him another 45 minutes. You don't oh, take him, you, you don't take him off at halftime because he, you know what I'm saying? Like you just, I, and I think with the limited weapons you have there, you take out another weapon. I think you're kind of, it's like friendly fire to yourself, you know? And I, and I think that's where uh, maybe Bob got too much of, maybe got too much into his head that, you know, we're going to bring spring and stuff, speed out outside and, you know, bring Mahala, bring Adrian Perez, but if you don't have anything working necessarily, you know, you take out a goal scoring threat like that. I think mm -hmm. Christian Torres should have definitely came out for either Mahala or Adrian Perez. That to me would have made it a little bit more different, more, 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 made more sense. And I understand what Bob Bradley says that he wanted to get Vela more in the middle. You can sometimes have BWP outside. I know he's a striker, but you still want to have a striker, a person that is as a quality proven goal scorer in this league for years. And, you know, that that was that was a big shock. And I, I just think they're going to look back at this game. I know they're in a, they're without their weapons. But to me, it goes back to Brian Smitcher, Smitcher out coaching Bob Riley back to back playoff years, just out coaching him. Um, and he knows everything that Bob Riley is going to do. And he knows how to beat that press. And he knows. And I don't think, I you know, like I said, both coaches are, are stubborn. I think Bob may be a little too stubborn in his way to maybe adjust to for this team because they know what you're going to do. And I think tactically when you play Seattle, it may have been, it would have been different. I think if you had Rodriguez and obviously Rossi, because what Rossi does, yeah, no one in Seattle would have been able to stop Rossi, but I think you tactically had to change a lot more than just a couple players, potentially formation, but potentially certain things. And you, cause you don't have the same players coming in for Rossi or Rodriguez, you know what I'm saying? And I think that's where, that's where um, Bob Bradley, I would, I'm going to say lacked, he, he lacked in his coaching tactics and he's lacked against uh, Brian Schmitzer and Seattle Sounders because they've pretty much owned LAFC in the playoffs. You know, last year LAFC was the best team, you know, Brian Schmitzer came in, he had a game plan, physical, you know, take Vela out the game, you know, and they, they won it they won it and you know this year again they i mean credit to seattle's big three nicholas odell jordan morris you know um who am i forgetting Raul rudy diaz 
their big players stepped up. And unfortunately for LAFC, I know Carlos Vela had an assist toward Eduardo Twista, but Carlos Vela didn't really show up. Mm-hmm. Although I know they're missing weapons, but you wanted a little bit more from Carlos Vela. You wanted him to make that PK and have, you know, more and more uh, effect in the game. And it, it was, I think it was very, very frustrating. And there's a lot of questions going to be asked about this team and moving forward. And, you know, just because Seattle's not going anywhere. Seattle, no. you're going to face Seattle every year because you're in the Western Conference. And I think you're right. I mean, Bob, we, I think everyone knows this, right? Bob Bradley can be a little bit stuck in his ways and a little bit stubborn and that kind of thing. But to your point, yeah, when you're facing a team like Seattle, like we keep saying, who has figured you out from top to bottom, you're going to have to make drastic changes. Now, you can only make so many changes, right, with the roster that you have. And this is why they really have to take a deep dive and a deep look into that back that back line. Mm-hmm. You have to make those adjustments. You have to bring in players that, go, that are going to help you elevate the entire team into a better position. Because if you go into next year with the same kind of roster, with the same kind of style and the same kind of play, like you say, Seattle is not going anywhere. They're going to come right back next year and give you the same thing they've been doing the last couple of years. So major adjustments need to be done there. And when you're playing a game like Seattle or a team like Seattle, bottom line is you want your best available players out there, period. Obviously, if they're injured, story changes. If they're not injured, there's really no reason why they're not on that pitch in such an important game like this one, especially in the one and done. What do you have to lose? Like you have to go out there, put your best players on the field and hope that they would produce. Um, and yeah, to to your other point, um, quiet night for Vela. It was a quiet night for a lot of these players. Like you said, he did have that assist um, with the Atuesta goal, but overall, the big players that they did have, it just wasn't a standout performance for any of them. And obviously that didn't help. And we saw how that came in then. But I'm very curious to see after this with those conversations, obviously we know that they're going to Champions League and this it's not like officially over. So be kind of interesting to see what progression they make, right? From yesterday going into that game and what approach they're going to be taking. But it's no secret that they can't come back next year and not, not stir the pot, not make some severe changes, some drastic changes that they're going to have to make this off season. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just, just to hit on that, like, even like, I mean, you had Kay, who's a quality player, Latif Blessing, who's a quality player, you know, but it just goes to show how strong uh, Seattle is in the yeah. midfield. They're, they're really strong and they're, they're better than LAFC in the midfield. We know they have LAFC has depth, but their midfield, their front three, obviously, was better than LAFC's front three. I think that this came down to the midfield. It also came down to no knew who, or I don't know how to say his name. He had a, he had a spectacular game for also for the Seattle Sounders. He had this mm-hmm. one header. I think Eddie Segura, and I was like on a, on a on a set piece. So if he didn't get to that free kick or to that header, Eddie Segura might have scored a goal. But like you know, every every Seattle Sounders player laid it on the line and on top of that this is a mature seattle sounders team they know they know themselves you know alex rodan you know he also has his brother there christian there's a, there's a lot of experience you know and then there's a lot of moving pieces with lafc and i think if you're going to play that 4-3-3 um you're going to need more speed in the back line more speed more uh more solidness back there and i think i was also surprised too with bob Bradley. um he subbed out mario in the second half, I think it was for Janela. He sub he subbed him out. I think for offensive purposes, but in the seventy third minute, you know, and, and you know, score and it was two one. I think at the time, uh, it was still two one. Yeah, it was. Uh, excuse me. It was. It got. It became two one in the in the in the seventy seventh minute, right after Jesus Mourinho went out. But I'm like, why why are you subbing Jesus Mourinho for Janela? You know, there's just there's just certain things that it, to me just didn't make make sense. You know, it just. Yeah. And I understood that, you know, their back was against the wall. And some of the, some of the lineup changes, some of the subs, some of the tactics, I think, um, looking back, you know, this is, I wonder how they're going to view it, you know, the, the front office and LAFC, because they were without the big players. But, you know, I just want to read uh, Bob Brad- this one quote that Bob Bradley said after the game when he talked about, um, you know, how they have, essentially they haven't pro- progressed, but I ended up posting this up on uh, LA Soccer Hub. So this is Bob Bradley's quote. He says, I take the responsibility that the development of our team, the improvement of our team, the ability to get to the next level, when you look at everything this year, 
you would say we didn't get to the next level, which was go far in the most playoffs. With the, you know, with the type of quality this team has, I think this goes back to the regular season, them falling to the seventh seed. They had an opportunity to be top four, but they didn't. I think they lost to San Jose or didn't get a result in San Jose. This had been going up before this, you know, and if I ended up catching up with them, they had to play the best team, in my opinion, in all MLS in the first round. You, you know, and say you play the fourth or say you're in the fourth seed, you have an easier team. You know, yeah. you could have played uh, who, who, who's in the fourth? Minnesota. You could have been Minnesota, Colorado. Wouldn't you rather face Minnesota, Colorado? Of course. But <laughs> you put yourself in this situation. Mm-hmm. Bob Riley and LAFC put themselves in the situation because they couldn't get things done in the regular season. You know, and, it, and it's it's that's what I'm talking about. This and those are the inconsistencies. But you know, if you're you're the head coach, you're this organization. You have to get those results during the season to give yourself a better opportunity. Because say you play Minnesota, or Colorado, you still you don't have Rossi or Brian or who's Sinfuentes. You may squeak out a win. Yeah. Then the next game coming in, you have all your weapons. Sporting KC's but may have Alan Pulido uh, come. You know, in the next round of playoffs. You don't think they're going to be even better? With 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 Alan Pulido, you know what I'm saying. So I think I think just the things that happen during the season, um, you know, I know Bob Bradley takes full responsibility, but I also think, you know, why why didn't they take responsibility when this was going on during the season? You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, because not saying that they didn't, but like why didn't these changes happen? Why like you know why didn't certain things happen? Because in three years of going to the playoffs last year was was the best year they've only won one playoff game so what changes would you would you have like you say um why didn't they make these changes sooner what changes would you have made i think the the the, 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 before they got jesus Mourinho, it was no secret that in orlando the defense was bad yeah it was it was it was no secret go back to the summer yeah go 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 back to the summer that that never changed they wanted you know i think tristan blackman to play you know there was a lot of things that i felt could have been addressed earlier all right, right. and it's easy for me to talk here with the microphone you know and, and the screen and do this but i think those things they try to um at least when they spoke to us the media they try to make it not sound that there was over big issues because they still had a season but they knew right. those issues uh, going to the Orlando tournament, you know, you you traded Walker Zimmerman. You yeah. know, there's there's a lot of things. Your your back line didn't look good. Your back line got beat in set pieces, and that was and that's why you got that's why you got knocked out of the uh, the MLS's back tournament. You know, on a set piece corner kick goal, and that was a trend for the whole year for LAFC. And I think those things could have been addressed sooner rather than you waited to get Jesus Mourinho. I think. A couple months ago, try to get him incorporated. You know, Andy Nahar was not going to be a player for you. He wasn't showing up. You know, there's things that I understand COVID and I don't know the, you know, the front office and the situations like this. But I think knowing that Andy Nahar was not going to be a player for you, knowing that you needed a center back, knowing those things, they waited a little too long, in my opinion. No, absolutely. Um. And, and it kind of goes back to just the issues that they've had all year long, right? As Bob says, they've been very inconsistent. Um, they, they've been bad at being able to finish, giving up goals, the de- defensive mistakes. And that's why I always kind of bring up Walker Zimmerman as my example of, you know, people are going to have their opinions and a lot of people don't agree. For me, letting go of him was the beginning of just the defensive just coming crumbling essentially i feel like his departure was the very beginning of this um defensive regression and they haven't like you say like haven't really addressed or done anything about it i mean their mls season technically is pretty much over right and they're still it is is over yeah it is over um they don't have they don't have those pieces that they like you say they should have gotten from the very beginning those defensive issues haven't changed at all from the very get-go. And and yes, we don't really know if they've tried to sign in players. We don't really know um, the details, right, of what's going on um, in those offices and in the front office and who they're trying to get and what they're actually doing to address the problems. But as far as we know and as far as we see and as far as the facts go, they haven't brought anyone to kind of fill that void, right? They haven't brought anyone to kind of fix those defensive issues. Well, they, um, brought, they brought Jesus Mourinho in, but I, they brought him, I feel like, a little too late. And he, they brought him on loan to buy, so we'll see if they're going to keep him. 
a little too late more. understatement you know to your point it, it is not a little too late it is too late you're basically towards the end of everything how much can you really fix in such a short amount of time um and i don't think he's enough you know i think that they still need to go out and and still bring in other pieces yeah. so just bringing that one player in is not going to fix anything especially in that amount of time that you're giving um considering that yes you put yourself in the worst this was the worst possible scenario for laoc going up against seattle everybody knew the second that game was over and we knew it was going to be an laoc seattle battle everybody knew you feel bad but you don't feel bad because like you say they put themselves in this situation they haven't really changed anything things are still going on they need to address the bigger issues here and until they do they're going to continue to put themselves in this situation um and that's why i keep emphasizing you know what they do this off season is going to be very telling because they need to be able to make those moves they need to be able to bring big big players in that are going to make that difference otherwise I mean, I don't know if this team necessarily can come back next year. I mean, we know that roster is going to change. We know a lot mm -hmm. of these players are not going to be here. If you don't make the moves now, you're not going to have a successful season. And, and that may be it. Yeah, no, and a lot of things are going to happen. Not, not, you just not not only need to address things in, in the uh, obviously in the back line, but also up top, because we don't know what Brian Rodriguez's future is yeah. with LAFC. We don't know Diego Rossi with the incredible year he's had. Um, you know, you know, you definitely know Europe is calling potentially calling for him. Um, you know, his market value has gone, I think, close to $20 million in that tough transfer market that that you know, I mean, that's just a number out there that's been from transfer market. But you're only worth what someone else or a team is willing to pay for. And I definitely do believe uh, Rossi is definitely worth close to $20 million if a team is willing to pull out, push out, uh, pull out the cash and pay LAFC that. Right. But I think. Brian Rodriguez, we know his his, uh, his agent's been very vocal about trying to get him out to Europe, trying to get, you know, whether it's Italy or wherever, the, you know, wherever he may land. Um, so you're going to be potentially out with Diego Rossi and Brian Rodriguez. Let's just hypothetically, let's put that out there, right? So very likely. Is, is Christian Torres going to be able to fill up, fill that void for Diego Rossi? Not at no. all. Um, not next year, no. give him two, three years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like not, not being 16, seven, maybe 17, he's not going to grow that much. I no, could be wrong, but time. I yeah, he needs, no, time. he needs time. He has, he has a lot of potential, but reality is he needs time. Yeah. So Mahala, I don't think he's going to be, be that player. You know, I haven't seen enough from him. We haven't been able to practice. I'm not, I don't think Mahala is going to be, uh, you know, replaced, but I think you're, you're not also going to have to spend money in the back line. I think LAFC is also going to have to spend money up top. They're going to be, if you sell Rossi for what you want to sell Rossi, and I think Brian Rodriguez, they want to get at least close to 15, 16 million is what I'm hearing. Um, you know you're gonna be have have money to to spend if you do if you do sell Brian and Rossi you're gonna have money to play with, but I also think they're gonna to have to address the, those two positions. You know we know Velastain, we know Danny Masewski. I'm not sure BWP is gonna come back. I gotta look into his contract. How, I don't know. I think he might have just signed a one year deal. I don't. We'll, we'll find that information out soon. Um, I don't know how much Bob Bradley. I mean Bradley Wright Phillips will want to stay after being subbed at half. I don't know. Uh, unless he was injured, I don't know, but he looks like he's playing well, well, and he's he's succeeding with with this. But I think if Danny Masovsky, um, he may get the start over BWP. You know, if you have a, a healthy Danny Masovsky, you can have him, who's a quality proven goal scorer. I don't think they're gonna lack a, as a fault, you know, in the, in the nine by nine spot, but they are gonna need help on the wings and the depth, right? Because if you need a sub in whoever is taken in place of Brian Rodriguez and Diego Rossi, who's going to come off the bench to sub one of them off, you know, and, you know, you, maybe you have Vela play the false number nine or whatever. There's, there's a lot of things that I feel like up top will need to be addressed. If those two players are going to be sold or traded. And then in the back line, I think you definitely need, need speed on the outside. If you're going to play the four, three, three, you're going to need speed. Um, you know, and I don't know, we, we hear about Latif Blessing every now and then. I mean, he's, yeah. a, he's a quality player. He's an mm -hmm. X factor. Um, you know, you definitely want him back. You know, he's, he's signed contract with them back. But there's rumors and rumblings that, you know, he may or may not be happy with the team. You know, I think I just think that you got to be able to spend that money if you're LAFC. You're an L.A. team. You know, spend that money. I understand that you sold Walker Zimmerman for $1.25 million. It looks like you're going to get that money from him. But if you're an L.A. team, you got to come here and be able to spend some money. You know, look at all the L.A. teams, Dodgers, Clippers, Lakers, and 
I think LAFC, even LA Galaxy, they spend money. I think LAFC has been reluctant right now with how they traded Walker Zimmerman um, to want to spend money on a player. You know, I think you should have spent the money on Walker Zimmerman. Maybe LAFC didn't think that he was worth the money. Maybe they thought they could get a, a less expensive option with, with, with Tristan Blackman. That didn't play out. Um, I, sh- I should also credit them that they did beat Leon and back in California Stadium without Walker Zimmerman. But I think just the way the season has played out and the way the type of season Walker Zimmerman has had, he's definitely worth that money. And I think LAFC really missed on that chance to pay a player who was the heart and soul of that defense, who was that voice of that defense. You didn't have that. And now you may have that with Jesus Mourinho. We'll have to see. But I think you definitely have to spend that money on those right and left backs. I think that they genuinely believe that getting rid of Walker, they believed a lot in the quote unquote depth that they had on their roster. They believed in those players. Therefore, they didn't necessarily find it necessary to or important to spend that money in order to get a, a player from that caliber like Walker. I if, if I had to put my money on it, I don't expect Diego Rossi to be back simply because he's going to end up in Europe. Someone like him, I mean, we would be so lucky if LAOC had him for another season. I don't anticipate that Brian Rodriguez is going to be back. However, with those two things said, I think LAOC is prepared for that. They know mm-hmm. the reality of the situation. They have a plan. We don't know that plan, but I, I'm sure that there is a plan intact for that possibility of, okay, we're losing two at top. There is a, a plan in place. And I don't put it by them that they wouldn't mind spending the money to get that quality player at top. When it comes to the back line, I feel like it's an entirely different story, right? Because that's what they've <laughs> shown so far. But I feel like after the season that they have had, they're going to have to go back to the drawing board and, and, and have to create that, you know, right? And create that budget for that player who's going to give you everything that you need. You're not going to be able to just depend on whomever's on the roster, whomever you think is good debt for your team. They're going to have to go out and spend money in order to get a, a good player back there. Um, so so up top, obviously, losing Rossi would be a big blow. Um, but I think it's the reality of the situation. And everyone's known that. And you're kind of going into the season. And even this season, you kind of went through it knowing that there is a big possibility he's not going to come back. And if we all know it, front office knows this. They have a plan intact, I'm sure. And it'll be exciting to see who they have their eyes on and who they're planning on coming to the city. Like you say, this is LA, right? Teams do spend money. Um Carlos Vela will be here next year. So we'll be kind of interesting to see what options they go with and just to see that dynamic um, of someone that could potentially be paired up with Vela. I don't, going back to Mahala and going back to Torres, no, they're going to need more time. They, like you, we haven't seen a lot of Mahala. Like he's played and had a few minutes here and there, but nothing enough for us to get really excited to see mm-hmm. his potential. With Torres, we are seeing that. But he's very young and he's going to need time. Um, I, I do think that he's going to play a big uh, part of the team, but not as as your starter for next season. I think eventually he can get there. But but no, I'm very I'm very curious. I'm very curious what they see, what they do this upcoming offseason with those with those positions, the, who they bring in um, will be very interesting. And if for whatever reason, Rossi and Rodriguez do come back, well, you don't even have to worry about it, right? Maybe yeah. slim to none chance, but yeah, I could I honestly the only way they come back is as if LAFC doesn't get what they are asking for. And I think I think I could be wrong on this, but I think Rossi's out of contract by the end of this year. I think I think so too. I think so. They definitely are gonna wanna sell him. If not, they're gonna have to pay him that money. Um, you know, so I think there's there's a lot a lot of moving pieces for LAFC. Um, you know, I just, I just and Christian Torres, he's an exciting player. You know, you got a SoCal player on yeah. the AFC. You know, you got you got a Southern California, you know, from Fontana, California. He's in your starting lineup. Um, but I think next season, depending what the moves are and everything, you're going to see him come off the bench. Um, you know, because if, you know, obviously if Rossi was here, he, he would have come off the bench and not playing. But I think that is a positive. You know, there are some positives. Yeah. You know, Danny Masovsky broke out of this. Yeah. Christian Torres broke out of this. You know, Jose, we saw Jose Sinfuentes. Um, we saw Eddie Segura play right back. Or we'll see what that looks next year. I don't know if that – he looked good, though, at right back. Jesus Mourinho looked good. Tristan Blackman looked good. But at times, Tristan Blackman looks a little shaky. But he looked solid. 
um, for this game. Jordan Harvey, I don't think Jordan Harvey's going to be back next year. I don't think so either. There's no way they bring him back. And I love him. You know, I have a soft spot for him. But it's just, it's time, you know, it's time. And even this year, I honestly think a big part of why they brought him back is because he he is that veteran, right? He mm-hmm. gives you that veteran presence in the locker room. Great locker room guy, just a great guy overall. As far as his productivity and what he brings to the team, I just don't see him coming back next year. Yeah, no, and 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 it's, and it's tough and it's tough because he's, he's a great player. He's for the city, um, but there's, there comes a point, he's pretty much at the end of his career, yeah. right? And there's, there's, a, there's a lot of more options there. And for LAFC, you don't even have to go outside of the MLS to get defenders. There's quality defenders in this league that you can bring. Um, whether a team is wanting to trade for with those for those assets, that's another thing. You know, you could pick up some you know players off of free agency, or you know, MLS is tricky how it works. You know, I think we're also trying to understand just certain things. Um, they don't share their their information like other leagues do, which is doesn't make mm-hmm. sense to me. You know, you don't know how much a player is making until I think the end, or I don't know if they're, they're going to disclose that stuff this year. Which Even makes, contract stuff, it's a hard time no, to find anything. Yeah, it makes no <laughs> sense. Well, I do know for Jesus Mourinho, there was, was I believe it was a loan to buy option. I think they had to pay 300000 I could be wrong, for the loan, and then they would have to pay a million to own own the player. So I think they'll have to pay. It was essentially what you got from Walker Zimmerman. I think you made $1.25 million. And essentially, if I'm understanding this right, you're kind of just giving that money right back. You know what I'm saying? You're, yeah. And a little more potentially, but like, yeah, it's it's about I don't know, I don't know. It, it just it just it's just interesting, and we'll see. Like, right, if Pablo Cisneros is your number one, is Kenneth Bemir okay with being the backup? Or you know, I know you have a third goalkeeper. You know, I think Pablo Cisneros has made, uh, Bob Riley's made it clear that he's he's a number one option. But what are you going to do with Kenneth? If he is he okay with being a solid backup number two? He looks good as a number two. I agree. He looks good as a number two, which is crazy to think about because when he was first brought here, obviously we were all under the impression. I'm sure even himself, he's going to be the number one, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it, it's been amazing to kind of see Cisnega grow into that position, though, and kind of been able to develop there. And um, competition's always good, you know. It makes it for for more competitive, more fun. Um, but I like that's why I said I wasn't surprised that he went with Cisniega. And for me, if I, I was taking my pick between the two right now, I'd still go with Cisniega. Yeah, yeah, I, I still go. I still go with Cisniega. Um, but I think, I think how I, I know their soccer season's not over. I know LFC season's not over. But I think obviously MLS, it's it's a big disappointment getting knocked out yeah. the first round. Um, like Bob Riley said, they didn't progress from last year to this year come playoff times. You know, obviously they took a step back. Um, but I, they still have Champions League and they're going to get all those weapons. If some, for whatever reason, they're able to make a deep run and, you know, reach the finals, which they probably could. These are going to be knockout games too. So anything yeah. can happen. Anything, things can break LAFC's way or it could be done the first game, you know, and in a season in a, in a year that seems is not is never ending for LAFC or any of us, they're going to, they're going to have another shot December 16th against Cruz Azul. Do you think that cons- that would be a consolation prize for this whole year? If they somehow win, win CONCACAF? Yes, I do. I do believe so. Um, I think they have now that MLS is, you know, kind of done and that whole thing's over with. I think that they do they do need to focus on this Champions League and being a good team and coming out and still showing why they are they are a competitive team. They need to be able to bring that spirit back here. They need that confidence back. They need to be able to um work together and just work on those on those um things that they've had trouble with. They need to be able to know that they can fix this issue and be a consistent team and do fix all the problems that they've had in the past year. And if they can come back and show that, and also we should have, they should have an entire roster for that game. So that's going to be a big, a big game changer. If they can come back and make a run and somehow win the whole thing or anything, absolutely. I think it's going to prove to themselves that when they work hard and they adjust and they make changes that they can be that competitive team um and they need that you know they need that little boost of confidence so in my opinion yeah yeah it would it would make a big difference yeah and i think things are going to get interesting here with the next couple of days because um i believe it's a no uh, november 30th that uh 
that the teams have, the teams that are out, out of the MLS playoffs, um, you know, teams that didn't make it, they have until November 30th. I think it may be different for the teams that are still in the, in the playoffs, but till November 30th to make roster moves, pretty much saying like, hey, yeah, we want to keep you for next season. Yeah. The way it's tricky is because you still have champions or CONCACAF December 16th. Yeah. So if you're a, say, XYZ player and you don't get, essentially, we don't want you back. Are you going to want to play on the CONCACAF? Are you even going to be on the roster Upward. for that? You, you know what I'm saying? Because LAFC submitted, you had to submit like a 30-man roster or something like that. So pretty much everybody's on it. But November 30th, um, I think I'm getting this right. You have to let know. You have to let MLS team know what who are the players are keeping, the roster moves and everything. And it's it is going to be a little awkward, you know, saying like, "Hey, maybe we, we don't want this player back," or we, you know, we do. <laughs> but are you gonna want? Are you gonna want to play in Champions League? Are you gonna maybe maybe if potentially if you're Jordan Harvey and this may be your last season with LAFC, yeah, you you still play Champions League, you know, or you know to show out for another team, or, exactly. You know, Exactly. You That's the consolation. Another, yeah, you still have mm-hmm. a trial for another team. Um, but it, it is gonna feel a little different going to training, going to practice, knowing that this essentially the team doesn't want you back next year. Yeah. And, and like you say, though, I think that's the biggest takeaway from that, from those people, those players that don't make the team. This is more or less like a trial for other teams to see what you're capable of doing, especially if the team goes on and makes a good run and does well eyes are going to be on you. Um, so yeah, definitely be a good opportunity for other teams to, you know, see your style of play, see how the improvements, see how this team is performing and hopefully, right, land in a di- on a different team if you're one of those players that unfortunately did get cut, um, which I do, obviously, there, there's going to be changes. Um, it'll be interesting to see what that looks like going going into that game. But Yeah. Well, Delby, I think that's it. Um, it's unfortunate because typically when the when the LA teams are out, I tend not to watch the MLS playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> but these have been so fun. So I may, I may yeah. tune. I mean, because you know how we're so invested. We, you know, we're on the calls, media calls, yeah. and um, I'm interested to see if they'll have a- exit interviews. I don't know if they. Well, never mind. I don't think they will because they still got they still got Champions League. But Galaxy didn't do they didn't do exit interviews. No, um, you know we'll see. Yeah, it's we'll, unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. So let's see. hopefully we'll we'll still 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 trying to see what what's going on with Pavone and you know LA Galaxy, uh, you know on the, on the other side and their coaching. They still haven't announced a coach. As of, <laughs> that as team of is a disaster. <laughs> as of November twenty fifth, so we'll see, we'll see what happens with the next couple of weeks and stuff. But yeah, it was a it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure to have you on. For the, for the people that already don't follow you, let them know where they can follow you, Delmi. You can find me across all social media at Delmi Barrias and LA Sports Access as well. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's always fun to come on and chat with you. Yeah, uh, Delmi, uh, thank you for uh, being with you, being here with me again. Um, guys, if you guys enjoyed this podcast episode, make sure to give this a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. You can listen on Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you get your music. Um, you can follow me at Gio Garcia LA and make sure to check out LA Soccer Hub for all the news, the insights, the videos and stuff from both LA teams, which is coming down to an end here with the MLS Cup, and we'll see what happens in Champions League. Uh, for Delmi, this is Gio. Bye, everybody. Bye.